Thanks a lot for having us. This is joint work with Martin, URM, Pablo, and Diego. Most of them are here. Credit cycles have been a leading topic in the discussion about macroeconomic stability. There is growing evidence that credit booms can create real damage. In this paper, we document that the real damage following credit booms vary with bankruptcy institutions. Those real damage arises because credit booms are followed with high debt burden and rising defaults. This is bankruptcy institutions matter for the resolution of those defaults and its real damage. For example, poor functioning bankruptcy can inefficiently liquidate viable firms in default, which exacerbates the economic loss. More generally, we want to emphasize the idea that legal institutions can be relevant for macroeconomic stability using bankruptcy institutions as an example. We use data on bankruptcy efficiency, business credit, and macro outcomes across 39 countries. For the key bankruptcy efficiency measure, we follow the work by Jankov et al. to measure the percentage of value preserved for a viable firm in bankruptcy. There are large cross-country variations in bankruptcy efficiency. Some countries liquidate inefficiently and incur very high costs. Other countries restructure efficiently with mod modest costs. So our main empirical results is that in countries with low bankruptcy efficiency, business credit booms are followed by long and severe contractions. However, in countries with high bankruptcy efficiency, business credit booms are followed by modest, if at all, output changes. To interpret those empirical findings, we build a simple model to explain how bankruptcy efficiency mitigates the negative consequences of credit booms by avoiding inefficient liquidations. We first provide a brief overview on the essence of business bankruptcy. So why are bankruptcy institutions relevant? First, the economic outcomes depend on the quality of default resolution. Second, the quality of default resolution depend on bankruptcy institutions. There are two particular approaches to default resolution. First, the traditional approach is to terminate operations of the firms in default and liquidate their assets. And this type of inefficient liquidation of viable companies induces substantial losses for example, loss of organizational capital. This can reduce output directly and generate negative macroeconomic spillovers. The more modern approach is to restructure viable firms if the continuation value is higher than the liquidation value. This more modern approach can keep viable firms alive and avoid output loss and its negative economic consequences. For the second point, how the quality of default resolution depends on bankruptcy institution. So bankruptcy is a legal process to facilitate default resolution. So the ideal outcome will be to restructure viable firms and liquidate unviable firms. Bankruptcy institutions through a combination of statutes and courts are designed to achieve this ideal outcome. For example, these institutions can alleviate information frictions by collecting and verifying information about the debtor, and they can alleviate the coordination frictions by preventing creditors' unilateral actions, disrupting resolution. And these functions can be particularly relevant for restructuring. However, achieving these functions is not an easy job. That's why there are large cross-country variations in bankruptcy efficiency. So we use the combined sample of 39 countries from 2003 to 2019. So the number of countries is restricted by the availability of the business credit data from uh, BIS, which includes both loans and bonds. And the time span is restricted by the availability of the bankruptcy efficiency data. For this key bankruptcy efficiency measure, we follow the work by Jankov et al., which has been extended by the World Bank. So they ask the legal professionals in 100 countries every year about the baseline case of a viable firm in bankruptcy with a continuation value 100 and liquidation value 70. So they ask those legal, legal professionals about the most likely scenario in bankruptcy. 
For example, the outcome, the value preserved, the duration, and expenses of the bankruptcy process. For the key bankruptcy efficiency measure is the percentage of the continuation value preserved net of expenses. And we verify that this measure is positively correlated with recovery rate imputed from impairment and non-performing loans. But there are some delicate measurement issues with the recovery rate. So we use the clean survey measure as our baseline measure for bankruptcy efficiency. So there are large variations in bankruptcy efficiency across the world. So this figure plots this baseline bankruptcy efficiency measure in the example year of 2015. So the y-axis is the bankruptcy efficiency and the x-axis is the bankruptcy duration. So a blue dot denotes a country where the viable firm is expected to survive and the red dot denotes a country where the viable firm is expected to die. And there are two reasons why bankruptcy can be inefficient. First, viable firms may not survive. Second, the duration can take years. Now we turn to our main empirical evidence. So we follow the specification in the credit cycle literature, for example, Mian and Sufi and Werner, to study the macro outcomes after changes in credit to GDP ratio. In particular, we estimate local projections for annual horizons from year one to year five we use I to denote a country and T to denote a year. So we study the change in log GDP investment consumption in the next H years denoted by delta Y following change in business credit to GDP ratio in the past five years denoted by delta C. And how this varies with bankruptcy efficiency B through the interaction term. So we control for five lakhs of real GDP growth and changes in household credit to GDP ratio in the past five years, and also the horizon specific country fixed effects. We find beta one is negative, which means GDP investment and consumption are significantly lower following credit booms in low bankruptcy efficiency country. However, beta two, the coefficient of the interaction term is positive, which means there is less decline when bankruptcy efficiency is high. This figure plots the path of GDP following a 10 percentage point increase in business credit to GDP ratio over the past five years, which occurs in around a third of our sample. So the left panel plots the impulse response for a country at the bottom quartile of bankruptcy efficiency. The right panel plots the impulse response for a country at the top panel. And we use Driscoll and Cray standard arrows. So the decline in real GDP in low bankruptcy efficiency country following credit booms are much greater than high bankruptcy efficiency country. The economic magnitude is significant. GDP declined by three percentage points uh, following the credit booms in the next five years in low bankruptcy efficiency country, but GDP barely declines in high bankruptcy efficiency country. The cumulative output loss over the next five years is nine percentage points lower in low bankruptcy efficiency country. The investment has the same pattern following business credit booms in low bankruptcy efficiency country, investment declines in high bankruptcy efficiency country, the investment barely moves. The consumption also follows the same pattern. Similar patterns also uh, occur for unemployment TFP and asset prices. You may observe that the recovery in low efficiency country following credit booms has not occurred by year five, but we do verify that the recovery occurs gradually between year six and year, nine, year 10. Uh, but for those longer term local projections, uh, we will need to lose a significant proportion of our sample. That's why we use five year horizon as our baseline analysis. And then there are two key reasons why macro outcomes decline following credit booms in low bankruptcy efficiency country. First, the recession probability increases following credit booms in low bankruptcy efficiency countries. Second, the recessions are deeper and longer in low efficiency countries. And we find supporting evidence for both channels. One obvious concern 
is that the bankruptcy efficiency measure can be correlated with other factors that stabilize the economy. Nothing is perfect, but we make sure that our results are robust to control for development status, exchange rate regime, general rule of law, GDP volatility, cyclicality of monetary, fiscal, and macro potential policy, and their interaction with business credit booms. Another concern is that the recession may lower bankruptcy efficiency, for example, court congestion. So we make sure that our results are robust to using the bankruptcy efficiency measure at the beginning of the sample. We also follow the literature to instrument the bankruptcy efficiency with legal origins, which explains around 30% of the variation in bankruptcy efficiency. And the results are robust to this instrumental variable version of our regression. We also use alternative windows for measuring business credit booms, for example, using the change in business credit to GDP ratio in the past three years, eight years instead of five years. Results are similar. We also check that the results are symmetric for business credit booms and contractions. To interpret those empirical findings, we build a simple model to study how and when bankruptcy efficiency mitigates the negative consequences of credit booms. So the model has a few key ingredients. First, firms finance risky investments with defaultable debt and optimally choose its leverage. Following default, firms either liquidate, which is inefficient and leads to output loss, or reorganize, which is efficient. We model the efficiency of bankruptcy institution in a country as the probability of inefficient liquidation post the default. So our model predicts that for no fundamental booms driven by discount rates or bias beliefs and viewed by the literature as the main driver of credit cycles, those type of credit booms are followed by lower output and more defaults. This is because uh, those type of booms are followed with higher leverage, more defaults, and more inefficient liquidation and output losses. Furthermore, the model predicts that more efficient bankruptcy system mitigates the negative consequences of these credit booms. This is because the more efficient bankruptcy decreases the likelihood of inefficient liquidation after default. And this is true even if more efficient bankruptcy increases the size of the credit market and leverage. Both predictions are consistent with our empirical evidence. However, the predictions for fundamental booms driven by increases in firms, of pro firms productivity are reversed. For example, those type of booms are followed by higher output and lower defaults because of the increases in firm's productivity. And these type of booms are inconsistent with our empirical evidence and the literature, which shows that the non-fundamental booms instead of fundamental booms are the main driver of credit cycles. To summarize, we show that credit booms are detrimental when business bankruptcy functions poorly, but not so much when business bankruptcy functions well. More broadly, we want to emphasize the idea that legal institutions can matter for macroeconomic stability. These considerations has motivated bankruptcy reforms, for example, in Japan in the late 90s, and it can be even more important when the economy relies more on intangible capital, which increases the wedge between uh, liquidation and reorganization. So our analysis also provides a new perspective on macroprudential policy, one common view is to use macroprudential policy to restrain credit booms to prevent their negative consequences. But macroprudential policies also have costs, for example, regulatory burdens and misallocation. So perhaps their net benefits are higher when credit booms are likely to create real damage. Moreover, an alternative approach is to improve legal institutions, for example, bankruptcy reforms in Japan, to enhance macroeconomic stability. So it's, in sum, it seems that understanding default resolution in practice can be useful for macroeconomic analysis. Our discussion team has some amazing uh, pioneering work in this area. And in our ongoing companion work, we build a quantitative model incorporating realistic features of corporate debt contracts 
including default resolution, and study the macro implications, for example, financial acceleration. Thank you.